monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. This is kind of like the sister brother to polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, to torsade. So you can see in monomorphic, just like the name implies, mono meaning the same, you can see that all of these different slopes look very similar, okay? So it's not like you saw with torsades where you have this kind of like irregularly irregular sinusoidal type rhythm, right? So this is this would be more of your torsades, right? Something like this where you would have this sinusoidal kind of rhythm. But you don't really see that here with the monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Okay, so you're gonna have similar peak amplitudes, more, a more regular rhythm overall, although you're not gonna really see, you know, T waves or P waves, right, because the rate is gonna be so fast. We're talking about, you know, you know 200 to 300 uh, beats per minute potentially, okay? So this is gonna be a pretty fast tachycardia. Because it's so fast, the heart doesn't really have time to fill, so the cardiac output's usually really poor. If someone has tach ventricular tachycardia, they could have an, um, an MI just from that. This can also be the complication of an MI. Right, so why does somebody even get a ventricular monomorphic tachycardia? This has to do with aberrant ventricular foci. So in other words, we have foci that are firing in the ventricles. So just for example, let me just show you, let's just say we have some myocardium here. Okay, and let's just say my patient has a history of coronary artery disease, and you know, some time ago this patient had an infarct, you know, right here. So there's some ischemic tissue here, maybe there's some Q waves, you know, on this patient's EKG. So what can happen is over time, this scar tissue is not gonna conduct electrical impulse. Normally my electrical impulses would go in some, you know, logical trajectory here. But let's just say in this patient, because they have this infarct, my impulses have to kind of go around this infarct. Well, what can happen is over time, right, this inf these electrical impulses can actually kind of swing around and create a re-entrant circuit here. And then this circuit can start firing, right, to all of these different sites in the ventricles. And then if you have a patient that has multiple infarction areas or multiple areas of scar tissue, which in reality, you know, many of these patients perhaps could have, right, if you, if you have a history of previous myocardial infarctions or ischemia, then you can have multiple sites where you can have these uh, ventricular foci generated and you can create these circuits that are essentially firing constantly. Okay, so these patients would be at higher risk. So usually ischemic and or structural heart disease usually will in some way disrupt the conductive physiology in the ventricles and cause some of these symptoms. And these can also be a complication of a recent MI. Okay, ventricular arrhythmias in general are gonna be very common in the first 24 to 48 hours after MI that's particularly high yield. Now the big one that comes up even more than ventricular tachycardia is ventricular fibrillation, which is essentially completely uncoordinated ventricular depolarizations. So you can think of this as like the super form of ventricular tachycardia. It's not organized at all. Here at least you have some organization, right? You're at least maybe having some cardiac output, even though it probably isn't enough to be sustainable. But here, there's really no coordinated action of the ventricles. There's just random electrical activity happening, and this is gonna be lethal, right? It can cause rapid sudden cardiac death because you're not pumping blood really, right? That's the concept. So still very high heart rates. Both of these note are gonna be wide curious, uh, tachycardias. And that's going to be different from SVT. So that's one way to tell them apart. You can see this is way more than three little boxes. I mean, we have probably seven or eight little boxes here just making up this one uh, QRS. Now, let's just say, theoretically speaking, right, in a board question, you get a tough question that they're asking you, okay, this patient has a ventricular arrhythmia 24 hours after their myocardial infarction. Okay, what antiarrhythmic do you want to use? So think about that for a second. What antiarrhythmic do you want to use, right? This patient just had a myocardial infarction. They have a ventricular arrhythmia. Think about your class 1B antiarrhythmics. Remember, these are very good in ischemia, very good with ischemia to the heart. Okay, remember we talked about that in the antiarrhythmic section. The other one that would be ideal here would be something like an amiodarone, especially if you have like a borderline concern for torsades. Again, amiodarone does not typically cause QT prolongation to the same extent as a lot of the other antiarrhythmics. So that's something else to just kind of keep in mind. But those are probably the big things that I would remember. The last thing I want to say here is that in general, again, ventricular fibrillation, life-threatening if not converted quickly to a normal rhythm. And this is actually the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. Okay, so this is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death. That's also important to remember, um, like I said, syncope and death within minutes if you don't convert a patient that has ventricular fibrillation. This is the rhythm, you know, in the majority of patients that have a cardiac arrest, this is the rhythm that they're going to have, you know, at some point during the cardiac arrest. And we'll talk a lot more about the management, um, ACLS and all of that in the step two lectures because you don't have to know as much about that for step one. But I think this will at least give you a good, 
you know, point to start from. 